All right, so today I want to introduce you to the Ball Python head stamp. If you've been into Ball Pythons even for a little while, you've probably heard of the head stamp. Essentially what it is, it's the pattern on the head of the Ball Python. And when it comes to identifying genes in your Ball Python, I'd say most people look at the body of the snake for the color and the pattern. Some people actually flip over the snake and look at the belly based on the pattern and sometimes the color on the belly. Sometimes you can pick out genes and a lot of people will actually look at the pattern on the head to figure out which genes are in your ball pythons. As a matter of fact, I've actually seen some people where they can look at the head and pick out multiple genes based on the pattern of the head. And let me tell you, when it comes to head stamps, I'd say it's more of an art than it is a science. It can be pretty variable. There's a few genes with really strong head stamps, and there's a few genes with just a little light head stamp, and some genes don't have any head stamp at all. But in all cases, you'll actually find exceptions to the rule. You'll actually find normal ball pythons that have a little bit of a head stamp. I'd say in most cases, the normal classic wild type doesn't have any head stamp at all, but every now and then you'll actually find a small pattern on them. So today I want to jump over to the internet and I want to show you a few ball python genes with really strong head stamps. All right, so I'm gonna jump over here on morphmarket.com and I wanna start with this snake right here. This is the clown gene in ball pythons. And the clown is considered pretty much to be the number one gene when it comes to head stamps, the pattern on the head of the snake. And usually the clown, just by itself, you can definitely tell it has a really strong pattern on top of the head. And you can actually mix other genes in with the clown and it really changes the pattern. Let me tell you, I could probably do a whole hour long video on just the clown and how the head stamp changes when you add other genes to the clown it's pretty amazing and usually if you look at just the clown by itself a lot of times it has these round circles on the top of the head I actually pulled up another example over here this one just has a couple circles right up here but sometimes like this example right here you'll actually see multiple little round circles on top of the head and of course with the clown it's pretty easy because it has a really strong pattern throughout the the whole body of the snake you can definitely tell it's a clown without looking at the head but kind of the interesting thing is when you work other genes into the clown you can definitely see a change in the head stamp and if you're really good you can actually figure out what those genes are by looking at the change of the head stamp. So here is another one with a really strong head stamp and that is the spot nose. And when it comes to spot nose, it's, it's kind of an interesting gene. Looking at the spot nose just by itself, it almost looks like just a normal classic wild type ball python until you look at the head of the snake and you get these really crazy patterns on the head of the snake. And a lot of times on the spot noses, you can actually see, uh, I've kind of tried to interpret what I see on some of these. Sometimes you can almost see like little angels Angel wings, like you have a little angel on top of the snake. This is kind of one example of the spot nose. I actually pulled another one up over here and take a look at this. This looks almost exactly like the paw print of a cat, which is pretty interesting. If you have a snake that looks normal and you have like what looks like a paw print of a cat, I can almost guarantee that you have a spot nose. And when it comes to spot nose, the spot nose is a pretty awesome gene. It's a really strong pattern enhancing gene. So a lot of times when you work it in, with other combinations, it can really jumble up the pattern of your combinations. So take a look at this. You can actually take the spot nose and work it into the clown and take a look at this. So this is two genes that really change the, the pattern on top of the head. And I've actually noticed on a lot of these spot nose clown combinations, if you actually kind of look at the head, sometimes you can you can look at a whole bunch of these snakes and kind of figure out based on the different patterns on the head, which genes that you have in the mix. And the more you actually look at the different head stamps, the more you can pick them up. So I've noticed on a lot of these spot nose clowns, it almost has on top of the head, it almost looks like two fake little eyes right on top of the head, which is pretty interesting. And these aren't the eyes, the eyes are over here on the side and these are just patterns that look like eyes. These even have little like eyeballs, <laughs> like the little pupils right in the middle of the eye. It's almost like a fake eye on top of the head. I actually pulled another one up over here. Take a look at this one. It's almost exactly the same with the little eyes on top of the head. So if you actually produce something like this and you're thinking, all right, it looks kind of like a clown. I'm wondering if there's spot nose in there. You can actually look at the pattern on the head and if it actually has these two little fake eyes on top of the head, you can almost be guaranteed that there is spot nose in your clown. 
So here's another gene with a really strong head stamp, and that is the spider. And the spider is pretty interesting too. A lot of times, the pattern on the top of the head of the spider really kind of opens it up. And sometimes you'll actually have these kind of wavy lines on either side of the head. A lot of times, the middle will have a little dot in it, and sometimes around that little dot, it'll be completely clear. I actually pulled up another spider over here, and take a look at this. This is kind of interesting. It has these little wavy lines right down the sides of the snake. And this one, it's sometimes it's kind of variable. This one almost has like a little heart right on top of the head. But I'd say in a lot of your spiders and spider combinations, you'll actually have these lines coming on either side of the head. Sometimes they're wavy and sometimes they're a little bit more straight. And sometimes they're really thin and kind of wispy lines in your spider combinations. Of course, the spider is really visually dominant. So if you actually look at the pattern of your snake, I'd say in most cases you can see by the pattern and the color on the body of the snake that you actually have spider in the mix. But let me tell you, in a lot of combinations, the head stamp is definitely a giveaway. So take a look at this combination. This is pretty interesting. This is actually the combination of all three genes, the spot nose, the spider, and the clown. And all of them have really strong head stamps on all the genes. And if you actually take a look at the head, it's kind of interesting. You know, at first glance, you're wondering, all right, which genes are in my snake? And the, the one thing you can actually look at is the head. And the first thing you might notice on the top of the head, it has these little round spots right above the eyes, almost like fake eyes right on either side of the head and that is a pretty much a sure bet that you have the combination of two genes the spot nose and the clown in there and then if you actually look up further up on the head you actually see these little lines coming up on either side of the head and that is pretty a pretty good indication that you have spider in the mix so in this case you can actually see all three genes just by looking at the head stamp which is pretty amazing so here's another gene that I've actually seen a lot of people say, hey, uh, my orange dream has a head stamp. And if you actually look through a lot of the orange dreams, sometimes you can actually see some pretty strong head stamps on your orange dreams. And I'd say this is, you, you actually see it on some combinations and some orange dreams, but it's definitely not as extreme as you would see as in the other genes that have really strong head stamps. As a matter of fact, I actually pulled up another orange dream over here. Take a look at this one. This is an orange dream and look at the head, pretty much looks like a normal classic wild type this is what most normals look like without the head stamp just like a solid color on the top of the head so you can definitely tell some orange dreams have it and some don't but when it comes to when it, when it comes to actually the clowns the spot noses and the spiders I'd say pretty much 99% of all the snakes you'll see with those genes will actually have a really strong head stamp and when it comes to orange dream maybe about 10% of the snakes will actually have a head stamp on them so here's another one. This is actually just a normal, like the classic wild type normal, like the, the type of ball python you'd find in the wild over in West Africa. And this one almost looks like it has a little bit of a head stamp on the top. It has a little light spot right here, which is kind of interesting. And if you actually look through all the normals, I would say 99.9% .9 of all the normals don't have anything on the head. It's just a solid colored head. As a matter of fact, if you're actually looking for new genes in some ball pythons say for example you're looking at some african imports or maybe you're kind of picking out some normals a lot of times what you can actually do is not only look at the color and the pattern of the snake you can flip it over and look at the belly sometimes you can see you know other genes in the belly pattern and sometimes just by looking at the head there might be other genes in your normal maybe new genes that have never been proven out if you're looking for like a dinker project kind of fishing for new genes and your normal has a really strong head stamp there might be something in that ball python. So here's the last one I wanted to show you. This one is crazy. This is probably one of the craziest head stamps I've ever seen. Every now and then you run across a combination of genes where you get this really crazy pattern on top of the head. And sometimes I've actually seen a lot of these where you actually have a multi-gene combination to give a really unique head stamp. And every time you make that combination, you get a really strong head stamp that looks exactly like all the other combinations with those specific genes. It's kind of interesting when you kind of looking through the head stamps and sometimes some of these breeders have been breeding certain combinations for so long they can actually look at the head stamp and figure out exactly what genes are in there where most people wouldn't have a clue just because they produce so many snakes and they have so much experience with the head stamps. 
All right, so it is time for the question of the day. And Jay Ain't asks, what kind of tubs do you use for your rodent rack and how often do your rodents chew through the tubs? And that is a very good question. So I actually have been breeding rats for about five years. And when I first started in rats, I actually started them off in glass aquariums with screen tops. And of course, with the glass aquarium, you never have a problem with the rat chewing through the glass, obviously. And I actually found out soon after I got the glass aquariums and the rats that the rack system is a lot easier to maintain versus every individual glass aquarium with rats in it. And so I started looking at different kind of systems as far as a rack system. And the first thing I actually looked at was a homemade rack system. You can actually go over to YouTube and a lot of people on YouTube will show you how to build a rodent rack. And I'd say probably 90% of everyone over on YouTube, they're like, yeah, this is how you do it. You actually use lumber like two by fours. And a lot of people will actually recommend the concrete mixing tubs. And believe it or not, I actually went to my local Home Depot looking for materials and I was adding it all up, figuring out the cost and everything. And the thing that changed my mind is I actually went over to the concrete mixing tubs and I picked one of those up. And let me tell you, they are extremely flimsy and the rats can definitely chew through the concrete mixing tubs. And I've actually seen some videos where people are trying to reinforce the areas that the rats are trying to chew through. They have little holes and they, you know, they're trying to glue in like window screens and a bunch of stuff like that. And I decided that was too risky. Let me tell you, I do not want rats running around my house that have escaped from the rat rack. So from there, I pretty much decided to go with a professional rodent system as far as a rack system. And I actually found some over on ARS caging. And let me tell you, that is what sold me. I've been using ARS caging racks pretty much since the beginning for about the last five years. And let me tell you, on all my tubs, there's not even one little bite mark on any of my tubs. It's pretty amazing. And kind of the cheap way you can actually do it is I've actually seen some people use the lumber from the hardware store and then for the tubs they'll actually go over to ARS caging and buy the tubs, you know, because since the rats can't chew through the tubs and they'll use them on their own homemade rack system, that's another option. So that is pretty much it. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next video.